6, and we are now this morning going to be looking at verses 15 and 16. So let's, uh, let's start with verse 10 and read down through 16, and then I'll, I'll say a quick prayer for our time together around that. Finally, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, our text today, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for a, a portion of your word that delineates for us uh, the whole armor, <laughs> uh, a listing of spiritual truths that we can put on, uh, strength that we can uh, carry from you and, and, and put on ourselves and arm ourselves with and gird ourselves with. We thank you, Father, for the, the comprehensive nature of this text, that it is the whole armor of God, and by using it and by putting it on, we can stand. We thank you for that, Father. We pray that, uh, again, as we have been talking all along, that we'll be able to see and understand this battle that we're in, <clears throat> understand that we are in it, we're in the thick of it, we're on the front lines every day. Help us to realize that, Father. Help us as we move through the day and as different things come to our mind, different circumstances present themselves to us that we will comprehend this is warfare. And the way we respond uh, either gives us victory in that moment, brings glory to you, brings safety to us and, and protection to those we love, or, Father, we do the opposite and we fall to those temptations, and we lay down our shield, and we take the hits, and we bring you dishonor, and we bring shame and dishonor and harm on those we love. Help us, Father, to understand that, that uh, we are in a battle. Help us, Father, as we look this morning at uh, two more aspects. Help us to understand that the peace we experience because of our relationship with you is something that fortifies us and strengthens us. Help us to understand, Father, that trusting in you, the shield, uh, trusting in your word is, is like a massive tank standing before us, taking the, taking the hits from the enemy. Help us to understand that, Father, that uh, we're not left on the battlefield empty-handed. We're not left out there totally exposed. You have provided for us what we need in order to stand. Help us to see that as we look in our, our text this morning a little more clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I understand that the shield is not a tank, <laughs> but if I was out on a battlefield and uh, flaming arrows flying towards me by the thousands. A shield, as we'll see, a door-sized shield in front of me would be something that I would not want to put down. And it would feel like a tank, wouldn't it? <clears throat> I remember a question that Irving Jensen asked in one of his study guides. Irving Jensen's uh, inductive study guides. If you've never seen them, you ought to pick one up if you have a favorite book of the Bible. Uh, you go to the used bookstore or go to uh, uh, go online, and Irving Jensen has a series of study guides on every book of the Bible, and uh, it will take you, depending on how fast you work on it, a long time to finish that study guide because it's inductive, and he has you 
read the text and answer this question. And now, and when I say the text, I mean the whole, the whole book sometimes. And then he'll ask you to go back and read the whole book again and look for this. And then by the fifth or sixth time he's had you read the book, then you begin to take a look at the pieces and you really do some work. But I remember one of the questions that he asked on 1 Samuel, in the study guide on 1 Samuel, why did God have David fight Goliath? Why did that event occur? And of course, Jensen did not have, in the back of his study guide, he did not have the answers. <laughs> so you had, to, you had to give it your best. Uh, sometimes you were kind of just left wondering exactly what is the answer to that question. But he did a really good job because he made you really ponder and he made you really wrestle with the text and, and look through all of the, the possible answers. One of his thoughts about why that event occurred was that it catapulted David into the limelight. It, it put him on center stage in the king's court. It, uh, it made him the hero of Israel. If you remember the girls, the maidens all began to write songs and sing songs about David. The men uh, respected David. The king promoted him, right? Uh, but think about that event. <clears throat> for a moment and think about how that event strengthened David. As you're going through and thinking about the possible answers there, why, why did that event happen? I, one of the things that I thought about was just think about how that bolstered his reliance upon God. At the very beginning of his career, the very beginning of his life, which was going to picture for us, uh, in a sense, the, the life of Christ in, in many ways, uh, you know, a great, great king who, who conquered and dominated, you know. But just think, think about how that event, time and time and time again, came back to the front of David's mind when he was in so many different circumstances. And it totally changed the way he dealt with that circumstance that was before him then because of what happened with Goliath. Think about Goliath for a moment. Nine foot six tall. If he was well-proportioned, and I imagine he was, I don't think he was some lumbering, clumsy giant. If he was well-proportioned, you take that nine foot six, and he would probably have been somewhere around 400 pounds, twice the weight of the average man. Not the average man, twice the weight of me, okay? Twice the, twice the weight of big men. <laughs> and you think about this, he wasn't some clumsy, lumbering, uncoordinated guy dealing with a hand a handicap whatever you call uh call it when you when you're when you're too tall he was a military champion right there was legends about him at the time of of his of, of when he was alive think about his scale armor of bronze weighed 125 pounds most of us couldn't even lift that and yet he went into battle uh, armored with that his spear, we're told, was like a weaver's beam, 14 feet long. The point of it weighed 15 pounds. That's the weight of a, a college uh, shot put. Now, this man was massive. And some people like to make the point as, as they think about David and they think about Goliath in this situation, they like to make the point that the reason that David was able to defeat this formidable foe was because that he rejected the armor that was offered him by Saul. And he went out into the battlefield limber and, and loose with, with no armor at all. And so he was able to maneuver quickly. I don't, I don't like <clears throat> thinking along those lines. I, I don't know if we're ever told, I'd like to have somebody tell me, not during the sermon, but after, if, you're, if we're ever told in scripture exactly how it was that David was able to defeat Goliath and why was he able to do so. I I tend to look at the rest of Scripture and some of David's Psalms and think that it was simply because God was orchestrating the entire event, and God was in control, and God made him strong. I think David ran out onto the battlefield and ran towards that giant in the strength of the Lord, like we're told to do here in our text, to face our enemy in the strength of the Lord. I love Psalm 18. Let me read just a portion of that. Um, Psalm 18, 
verses 29 through 36, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there. Psalm 18, 29 through 36 says, it's David's psalm, one of his psalms. It says, for by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. But this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless? He made my feet like the, like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a, a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. There's a lot of allusions there to our text this morning. And I believe God had everything to do with the victory there that day. And God has everything to do with the victory that we experience on the battlefield too. David's faith was set ablaze that day when he fought and defeated Goliath. And you know, every time we, we experience a battle and every time we face it in the strength of the Lord, every time we put on the armor and we, if we face those battles and we experience victories, they strengthen us. They strengthen us for the next one. And likewise, every time we're defeated, every time we lay down what God has given us and we're struck down, we're that much weaker the next time. You and I fight an enemy that is far more formidable, far more capable than Goliath. And if we could see Satan, if we could see his fallen angels, if we could just get a glimpse of of them, their size, their ability, we would realize that there is no way, no way in the world we're going to take them on in our own strength, in our own resolve, using our own, our own methods. We need to totally fall back on the Lord and wait on him and arm ourselves with what he's given us. And if we could see that, if we could see that that enemy, if we could see their strength, we would probably all sit down, open up to the book of Ephesians and say, I know Troy preached through this lately, but I need to look at it more closely. I need to study this a little more in depth and put on this whole armor. This morning, we're, as I said, taking up our text again, and we're going to look at the next two pieces of armor, and that is the shoes the war boots, and the war shield. So first, let's look at the shoes, the war boots. Look at verses 14 and 15 with me. Stand, therefore, <clears throat> having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So last week we, we looked at the necessity of being girded with truth and being secured, protected by the breastplate of righteousness. And now Paul goes on again to mention those words, stand, stand therefore, this time using shoes for your feet. What Paul is picturing here is the, uh, the Roman legionnaire's half boot. Um, it was what they wore when they were on duty. It was what they wore when, when they were going out to, to fight. And it, it was an open-toed leather boot with, a, with hobnails in the bottom. And the, if you look up hobnails uh, online or in the dictionary, you'll see uh, this little device uh, with screw threads up here and then down here a nail. And they would screw those in. Uh, by the multitude in the bottom of their shoes, maybe having 15 or 20 of them in, in the bottom of their shoes, a heavily nailed, studded sole, and this whole shoe uh, being tied to their ankles and shins with leather straps that went up their legs. These were, these were shoes for battle. 
These were not everyday uh, walking around town shoes. The hobnails, as I said, were, were steel studs that gripped the ground and it, it gave the soldier a, a sure footing while he was engaged. They fought very differently back then while he was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, face-to-face, -face, uh, right there with, with their enemy. As I said, these were not shoes for uh, everyday wear. They weren't shoes for running. Josephus, in fact, a historian uh, writing for the Romans, tells of a Roman centurion who was chasing uh, someone, an, an enemy, and they got to a place where there was a stone pavement. And as the Roman centurion hit that stone pavement and tried to follow uh, and tried to pursue, he slipped and fell. And the person he was chasing turned around and was able to just kill him right there on the spot because, because the shoes were not good for stone pavement, but they were good for the field. They were good for battle. So our text speaks of readiness, that word readiness, a picture those shoes and picture your feet in them. Your feet are firmly planted on, on solid ground. You're facing the enemy and when he advances towards you and pushes against you, your, your feet are locked into the ground. They have a, a grip in the ground. And the spiritual meaning here is, is found in the, in the last words of verse 15 where it, where it says, this readiness is ours because of the gospel of peace, the gospel of peace, the peace that is ours uh, when we are trusting in the Lord, when we're trusting in the, in the good news of his word. There, there, is a, there is a peace that, that comes to us through the gospel. And again, this time, there's more than one aspect to this peace. Uh, first, our peace that we have between us and God because of our relationship with him. There is a peace that we experience between us and God that strengthens us and readies us for what's coming our way, temptations and struggles. Romans 5, 1 says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So most of us know what it's like to not experience that peace between us and God. We've experienced and, and we have felt that, that extreme uneasiness because we can remember back to times when we were living without God and we were living our own life. We were living a life of rebellion. And we experienced, I said that uneasiness, but that is a, that is a bad understatement, isn't it? Extreme understatement. To not be right with the one who made us. To not be right with the one who has laid out his law of holiness and perfection before us. And we know that we're living in rebellion to that. To not be right with the one who says, I'm returning to the earth and I'm going to judge everyone. To not be right with him. As I said, uneasy is not the right word. It it can be terrifying, can it, to exist like that. But hopefully most of us have experienced that peace that comes when we, when we trust the Lord and we know that he sent his son to, to die in our place and we, we see his love for us in that. We see that he has, he has sent him to take the punishment that we deserve and, and we hear God in his word saying, this justifies you, this brings you into, into my family, this reconciles you with me. And we've experienced that. Most of us have experienced that peace that comes along with that. That is, a, that is an incredible peace to have the most important thing in your life settled and made right. And that strengthens us. When we face something in life that is tossing and turning us, I, I, I picture, a, you know, you hear about these, these boats uh, out in the middle of the ocean where there's no help to be found. And you hear about waves that are 60, 70, 80 feet tall, just tossing and turning every way. Sometimes we go through situations in life that are like that. And knowing that in the end, I am right with God. And my God loves me and he is in control. And I am with him because of what he's done. He's assured me that 
I am right with him. That makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? You know, if people pursue this peace, they pursue this calm, they know there's something in their heart, something in their life that's not right. It, I, always, I always picture it like the major gear that, that really makes a, a mechanism work. When that thing is out, there are just so many other gears that, that are not moving. So many other pulleys that, that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they're trying to somehow get things engaged and get things right in their life and experience the calm. And so what do they do? They go out and they search for shallow relationships that become way too intimate, way too quick, and those relationships crash, and they, they pursue that peace, and they pursue that calm in, in, in financial for success, for money, uh, uh, fame, acceptance, social, you know, on, the, on the Facebook and things like that, looking somehow to be accepted, to, be, to experience a, a calm. And you know what? A lot of times that is just like when you're driving down the highway and you, you see that mirage on the highway and you think it looks like water. It looks, it looks like there's, there's something there. And as you approach and you come closer and closer, all of a sudden it just disappears. You know, people so often pursuing this calm and this peace in so many different ways. And then they realize right when they're there that this is not it. But God offers us that. There is a, there's a very real peace that we experience when the most important thing in our life is right. And that is our relationship with Christ. Knowing our sins are forgiven, knowing we're reconciled with God, there is a, there is a joy, there is a, a settled feeling of peace that nothing else can offer. And the point is, when our, when our feet are firmly planted in the security, in, in the sure footing of that peace, then we can stand against whatever Satan throws at us when we're armored with everything else that he provides. But this is a critical part of it. There's another, another aspect to this peace. We not only have peace with God, but because of that, we experience the peace of God. Remember in the upper room, the last night of Jesus' earthly life, he is with his disciples, and he's teaching them, and he says this to them. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. He gives a peace, if you look at that, unlike anything the world can offer. He gives a real peace. He says, my peace, his personal peace. You think about that for a minute. You think about the peace that Jesus experienced as he, as he uh, walked on this earth. You think of the time, uh, I can't remember where he was, maybe Capernaum, and uh, just the masses and masses of people that came to him for, for healing. And he stayed up all through the night healing these people. And the next morning finds him out alone, communing with God in prayer, spending time spending time with God. Even after such a crazy night, he's, he's there experiencing that. You think of the time when Jesus was, was um, in the boat and, and, the, and the Sea of Galilee is just tossing and turning and the, the disciples are scared for their lives and there's Jesus asleep in the boat. <laughs> could have been because he was exhausted. It also could have been, been because of a, a peace, an inner peace. You think about Pilate questioning Jesus and, and um, being kind of unnerved because of the way Jesus responded to him. Jesus wasn't even answering his questions. I remember uh, Pilate saying, you will not speak to me. Do you, do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And remember how Jesus responded. And in my mind, I read it and I can see in his face a piece that says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. There is a, there's a, an assurance in the fact that God is in control. Nothing is happening outside of his will. Nothing is happening that God is up there fretting about. He is totally in control, and that gives us, that gives us a peace. 
a very real peace that, that aids us in times of turmoil. The word behind this peace is shalom, and it means completeness. It means soundness. It means well-being. And Paul speaks of this in, in Philippians 4, 7, when he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I, I love that. I've got in my Bible written down, and I don't know, um, I think it has to do with the tense of the verb, it will keep a constant guard, a constant guard over you. Like a platoon of, of soldiers, God's peace will surround and protect. And that's a promise. It's a wonderful promise. His peace surpasses all understanding. I think we all have talked to fellow believers who have gone through horrible, horrible situations. Just life-altering experiences, and heard them say, in the midst of it, God gave me a peace, a calm that should not have been mine because of the circumstances, but it was just like it, it came down and, and covered me and protected me during that time. I've heard that numerous times. When you know you have peace with God, and therefore you have the peace of God. Paul is telling us, the Holy Spirit, God, God is telling us, that is armor, and that protects you. And you need to be cognizant of it. And you need to rely on it when it comes time for your, your battle, so that you can stand. You know, when you're thinking about this peace, you... Your mind has to go to the thought that there are a lot of Christians who are not experiencing this peace because they're living a life of rebellion, because they're living outside of God's will. Uh, you, you, we've all heard that you know there's, there's no one more in turmoil, no one more unsettled than the child of God who's running away from God. Uh, they just can't be happy. They cannot be satisfied and settled in their sin. And that's very true. That person is not standing. That person is in a constant state of tripping. They are on totally unsure ground. Their, their lives are consumed with, with doubt and, and anxiety. But remember Philippians 4, 6, along with 7. It's very, the step is simple. <laughs> thank goodness God has made it simple but to just turn, to repent to confess, to come back to God the, the verse before the one I read before Romans or Philippians 4, 6 along with 7 says do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and then in the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, if you are rebelling, if you're outside of God's will, you understand that, that feeling of turmoil, that, 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 uh, that feeling of anxiety, that feeling of unrest, but all it takes is a turning back to God, and He is there and ready, just like when the prodigal son came to his mind, right? I found an illustration, and uh, instead of just trying to uh, retell the story, I'd like to read it because I think it was written pretty well, talking about this peace that we have. It says, long ago, a man sought the perfect picture of peace, uh, the perfect painting of peace, and not finding one that satisfied, he announced a contest to produce this masterpiece. The challenge stirred the imagination of artists everywhere, and paintings arrived from far and wide. Finally, the great day of revelation arrived, and the judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another, while the viewers clapped and cheered. The tensions grew. Only two pictures remained veiled. And as a judge pulled the cover from one, a hush fell over the crowd. 
a mirror smooth lake reflected lacy green birches under the soft blush of the evening sky along the grassy shore a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed surely this was the winner <laughs> The man with the vision, the man with the, the, the one who was seeking this perfect picture, uncovered the second painting himself. And the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace? A tumultuous waterfall cascaded down a rocky precipice. The crowd could almost feel its cold, penetrating spray. Stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning, wind, and rain. In the midst of the thundering noises and bitter chill, a spindly tree clung to the rocks at the Ed Falls. And one of the branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience its full power. A little bird had built a nest in the elbow of that branch, content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs with her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones. She manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. <laughs> but that gave us a good picture of all that we experience in life that is so difficult and so painful that there can be a, a peace that we can experience because of our relationship with God. The peace that God provides it makes us strong. It makes us sure-footed, and it keeps us standing, as Paul has said time and time again. That is the objective, to stand. Okay, so there's one more that we're going to look at today. The next piece of armor, and that is the shield, the war shield. Verse 16 says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The shield that uh, Paul is speaking about is not the small round one. I was kind of bothered by one of my commentaries. I have eight or nine commentaries on Ephesians and even looked up several more online. One of them um, said this is the small round shield that was attached to the soldier's uh, uh, opposite arm of his uh, arm that he used. Everyone else said, no, it's not. It is the large door-shaped shield from which the Greek word for shield actually comes from the word door. So it's pretty obvious. Made me think I need to watch that commentary going forward. But this shield that he's speaking about is about four foot tall, about two to three foot wide, made of two laminations of, of wood, uh, surrounded by leather, layered with leather, several, several uh, layers of leather, actually. And then surrounded with iron, and then a large iron ornament on the front. My Greek philosopher, Homer, uh, by the way, also uh, used this word, uh, to describe a, a large shield, the shape of a door. Um, you've might, maybe you've also heard of the Spartan mother who uh, we have a writing that's been found of her telling her son, be sure that you re return with your, with your shield or on it. <laughs> I think she means at least bring back, let him bring back your dead body if you die. So it was a shield that was large enough to be used as something to carry, carry a, uh, a soldier on. They could put their entire body behind it. I think that's important that we that we understand that and we see that, uh, that we can picture it. It would it would receive instead of the body receiving uh, the arrows, the the javelins that were that were hurled at it. I remember Chip Ingram. I have written down in my Bible a note where Chip Ingram said uh, that there was an account of a Roman soldier who's whose shield after a battle had 200 arrows, 200 some odd arrows stuck in it. Some of those arrows would have been dipped in or tipped in, in tar and lit a flame and they would have been uh, on fire when they hit that shield. The shield would have extinguished uh, that fire. These shields 
could have been locked together. Just to go through some of the things a lot of you probably have already heard and know, these shields could have been locked together by the Roman soldiers so that it could have provide, it could provide corporate protection for all of them. When I, when I read about that, I thought about uh, a picture, a painting that I've seen of Perpetua. I think this is the one that I've seen of Perpetua. The young, I think she was 22 years old, a mother uh, who was uh, killed because of persecution, because of Christian persecution. Um, there's a painting, I believe, of her standing in the middle of the arena, surrounded by other believers. They all have their heads bowed in prayer. And, and I've seen it a couple different ways. One with a gladiator with his, with his sword at her throat, another one with a, a lion coming into the arena. But at that time of extreme warfare, battle, um, that time of ex extreme struggle, that, that picture of all of those Christians together uh, receiving strength from one another, the faith of one another, strength in the other. It just gave me a picture of those Roman soldiers all locking their shields together. The picture that, that Paul is, is painting for us here is as we battle, as we're in warfare, the enemy launches volley after volley of flaming darts, temptations and, and strategies and deceptions to inflame us, to, to destroy us, to ruin us. But regardless of the, of the number of those uh, darts, uh, regardless of the destructive power that's, that's heaped upon us, we have a shield. Again, not the little one, but we have a massive shield that we can hide behind. That's the shield of faith as we trust God, as we trust his word. You think about this. We, we all have... We all have lusts and passions inside of us that are like an incendiary box of whatever, of, of, of wood and, and, and fuel, just ready to ignite. I remember back to the guy that I saw on 71 Highway uh, who totally lost it in a, in a fit of road rage and was beyond, uh, I don't know, beyond explanation. The guy scared me to death, even though I was in my car two car lengths away. The thought went through my mind, they need help. Maybe you could get out and you say something. And then I thought, no, just stay in your car. <laughs> because this guy, because of something that happened on the road, was instantly like a box of firecrackers, just, just going off. And in reality, all of us as people struggling with the flesh, struggling with temptations, assaulted from every direction, we, we really are way too often that close to just all it takes is a spark from the enemy and we're ablaze at that point when we find ourselves at that point and we all do find ourselves there whether that be anger whether that be coveting whether that be whatever it's sexual temptation whatever it might be when we find ourselves in that spot, we need to remember the shield that we've been given. Because that's the point where we are either going to take up that shield and duck in behind it and let it take the darts, or at that point, we're going to set it aside and willingly take the hits and take the destruction that comes along with it. We need to remember that his word to us, and that's what we're trusting in. We're trusting in God himself. We're trusting in his word to us. We need to understand that his word, his direction for us is for our good, like a shield in the middle of a battle. It's for his glory. It's, it's for the good of all those we love. Think about this. When we're in the middle of a battle, and we're so easily inflamed. If we set that aside and we go up in flames, those we love closest to us also are hurt, aren't they? We need to trust him. And we trust him by saying, I recognize the temptation. I recognize the fiery darts. And everything in me is saying to set my shield aside and to go forward, but I'm going to trust God that he 
has his best for me and for those I love. And instead of setting it aside, take it up and shield ourselves. Trusting him for our protection. Those fiery darts, it's quite a picture. Thudding into that shield and being extinguished or glancing off because of that ornament on the front. Peter speaks about this, the, the fiery trials that we experience as Christians. He's talking more about tragedies and illnesses and persecution. So many Christians around the world are, are facing just incredible persecution. With, along with these, uh, we are totally attacked by, by Satan. I, I thought when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, like some politicians can't let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, the enemy, our enemy, Satan and his minions, they see a, a tough time we're going through, maybe brought on by them, maybe not, but if not, they jump all over it and exploit it for their purposes, don't they? they try to try to pounce with casting doubt into our minds about God's goodness, doubt into our minds about God's love for us, doubt about the genuineness of our faith, doubt about the very existence of God. <laughs> they take advantage of every opportunity they can. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We can turn every one of those situations in the strength of the Lord being armored by God. We can turn every one of those circumstances into something that strengthens us and draws us closer to the Lord instead of something that weakens us and drives us further away. We need to remind ourselves of what God has told us in his word. When the trials hit, trust, trust him. Trust his word. See, this is, this is speaking about a, a firm and unwavering confidence in God. Continually relying upon him, knowing that he is there, knowing that he is on the throne, knowing that he is in charge, knowing that things are not out of control, knowing that he does love you, he does care, he is aware. Just think of the, the multitude of, of verses and scriptures and promises and, and examples we have in scripture of God being a shield for us, being a refuge. Look at the first, the first words of, of verse 16. It says, in all circumstances. Another translation, at all times. Another one, above all, or the Net Bible, in everything. Paul, Paul adds emphasis to this, doesn't he? he? He doesn't just move on to the next piece. He, he pauses for a minute and he emphasizes the shield of faith. The armor of God is incomplete without this shield. Just, just think about this for a minute. The shield gives effectiveness to the other pieces of armor. Think about the breastplate of righteousness. How do you put on the breastplate of righteousness? You put it on by trusting God at his word, don't you? You look at what God says in scripture about, about how I can be righteous before God, and we realize that it's not through something that I do. It's not through monumental efforts on my own. No, it's something that God has done for me, and, I, and I'm I'm not to work for it. I'm simply to throw my whole weight on him and trust him. I am taking his word and I am saying, okay, I'm trusting you for the righteousness you're providing me. So there's an aspect there where the shield, the shield of faith protects and, and fortifies all the other armor. And it does, doesn't it? Can you imagine going out into a battle where literally thousands of flaming darts are flying at you just with the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the belt of truth, and a sword in your hand. 
Can you imagine that? You would still take hit after hit after hit. What a blessing it is that we have a door size shield to hide behind. Faith, faith in God is beyond explanation as far as its importance. Jesus, think about him being tempted in the wilderness by Satan again and again and again. Every time he responded with, but God's word says this, and I'm standing on God's word. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, said, faith here in our text means the ability to apply quickly what we believe so as to repel everything the devil does or attempts to do to us. To know his word, to trust his word, and to be able to use his word, we're to take up the shield right? And again, Peter's advice is similar. When he speaks of the devil prowling, prowling around like a, like a roaring lion, he says, resist him, firm in your faith. Stay behind that shield, and you'll be safe. I move out from behind it, and things get real nasty, real quick. 1 John 5, 4 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Trusting in God. So many examples, again, David and uh, Gideon, and just on and on we could go. Faith binds us to the Lord. It unites us to him. It doesn't mean simply to, to believe what he says, but to believe and trust with all your weight. It is resting on the person of God, resting on his word. I think it would really be something to be able to have our eyes opened and to be able to see the spiritual battle going on, kind of like Elisha and his servant. If we could see not the enemy arrayed against us, but to see the darts, to see the weapons flying toward us. If we could see them as they really were, if we could understand them as we experience them on a daily basis and see what's really happening here in this spiritual war, the sins of commission that we fall for, the sins of omission that we, that we just blindly walk past. I think you and I would be spending so much more time in the Word. I think we'd be making Excel, Excel spreadsheets. We'd be, we'd be doing everything we could to categorize and to understand and to, to group together different defenses. I think we'd, be, we'd take God's Word much more seriously, wouldn't we? Machen, J. Gresham Machen said this. And think about this. Machen was a... Uh, professor, a, a, a major part of Princeton, a major part of um, Westminster, of schooling, of teaching, preparing pastors. He said this, he says, the more we know of God, the more we unreservedly will trust him. The greater our progress in theology, the simpler and more childlike will be our faith. I think that's excellent. The more we know of God, the more we, the more unreservedly we will trust him. The greater our progress in theology, the simpler and more childlike will be our faith. Think about David again, going back to where we started. David was looking at and speaking to Goliath, the enemy of God's people, the enemy who was blaspheming God himself. But David had on his mind and had in his sights God. He was focused on God. Listen, listen to 1 Samuel verses, chapter 17, verses 45 through 48. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. <laughs> and with that, David took off at a dead run towards this massive armored champion enemy with his sling whirling above his head. And remember the, the way that story ends. And that giant is shocked as a rock hits him dead in the forehead and he falls with a thud. Can you imagine the silence? Uh, yeah, I think after it, I haven't, I haven't read it. And I haven't gone forward and looked at it. But in my mind, I'm picturing, and maybe it's because I've read it so many times, a mighty roar of uh, just a shout from the people of Israel as they see that. But can you imagine the silence as the Philistines watch their enemy drop? Uh, not their enemy, their champion drop. David went in the strength of the Lord. Are your feet shod with peace? <laughs> are you sure-footed, un unmovable, because you are in a right standing with God? Does that give you a solid place to stand when you're fighting? Regardless of the, the tumult around you, regardless of the uproar, of the commotion, are you at rest in God because of your relationship with him? Are you experiencing that peace? And then secondly, are you utilizing that massive door-sized shield that God has provided for you to protect you? Trust in him, faith in him, in every word that he's spoken. Think about it. Again, as we go back and think about the early part of this text, this is armor that is given by God, and this truly is, isn't it? This is his armor that he's providing for us. Remember how the section started. We'll, we'll end with this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can trust it. That day after day, we can, we can open it up and we can find their direction and guidance. Thank you, Father, for, for showing us that it's, it's not just showing us how to go out and fight on our own, but it's showing us that we are to constantly rely on you. I want to use the word wait, but on another hand, I don't want to use that word. We are to wait on you. We are to look to you. We are to use the, the strength that you provide. But on the other hand, Father, you've, you've shown us that we are to take up, we are to put on, we are to stand, we are to actively yield uh, to your work in our life. Father, I pray for each one of us. I pray for the fathers and the mothers. I pray for the, the single people. I pray for the children. I, I pray for every one of us. Uh, however we find ourselves right now in this world, I pray that you will show us that we are to rely on you, that we are to be so closely connected to you that that we are in you, <laughs> and we are experiencing this battle from you, from the refuge that you provide, the shield that you provide. I pray for each one of us, Father, that we will spend time in your word, we'll spend time in prayer, that we will take the time, take the time that... Uh, 
is equally represented by, by the struggles that we're experiencing. The more struggle, the more temptation, the more time we should be spending in your presence. And I pray for each one of us, Father, that we will live lives that honor you. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.